Good morning, friends. I'm very happy to be here and have an opportunity to share some ideas with you. Uh, my presentation is going to look at the whole question of how we represent gender in the media and maybe try and question some of the uh, kind of commonsensical notions that we have about the relationship between media and society and in doing so probably get us to rethink how we think of ourselves as media producers vis-a-vis -vis audiences. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to talk about the whole question of language. And I think uh, language is not something just innocuous, but language naturalizes certain ways of seeing. And I'd like to take the example of the word Eve teasing. Uh, Eve teasing is something that we use very uh, kind of, you know, commonsensically, naturally. But I think Eve teasing is uh, not an innocuous word. It is a word, and I'd like to quote here from uh, Pratibha Bakshi, who's written this in uh, issue of seminar 2001. She says, Eve teasing refers to all forms of harassment women face in public spaces that are considered trivial, funny, and a part of everyday life, thus acting as normal mechanisms legitimizing harassment by positioning the very presence of women in public space as provocative. It normalizes and escalates violence against women in public spaces while simultaneously making invisible forms of violence in the domestic arenas as the distinction between the two domains is increasingly challenged. So I think uh, uh, what Eve teasing does is that it makes uh, it, the, the very word teasing and the very word Eve, I think, you know, Eve as uh, uh, the temptress in the public space and teasing as something that's, you know, harmless. I, I think we need to think about, uh, you know, such use of such language that sort of has built in within it a certain way of seeing. Uh, secondly, uh, how does one uh, construct gender violence in public discourse? Uh, what constitutes violence? What forms of violence are visibilized by the media and what forms are not? What forms are invisible? And here I'd like to say that uh, very often the media tends to focus on individual violence, so violence against individual women. That gets a lot of attention. And particularly if they're middle class women or upper class women, it gets more attention. Whereas you look at the whole realm of state violence against women. You look at the kind of violence that's happening in places like Manipur, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, Chhattisgarh, where uh, thousands of women are being raped, uh, you know, violated in all kinds of ways by the armed forces. That does not get any kind of mention in the media. Uh, when one looks at street violence versus domestic violence, uh, public uh, street violence gets much more visibility. Domestic violence is, by and large, invisibilized, both by women themselves as well as uh, by the media. And particularly when it comes to the middle class, I think it becomes even more of uh, invisibilization of domestic violence. We always think that domestic violence is something that happens, you know, uh, poor people beat up, uh, you know, poor men beat up uh, poor women, but we don't look at the whole realm of where there's a lot of violence in middle and upper middle classes that is totally invisibilized, both in public discourse as well as in the media. Uh, the third thing I'd like to kind of, you know, look uh, at is the, how do we look at the whole question of impact of media? And very often we tend to think of media as impacting a less powerful other. So we think, ah, yes, those people who live in slums, those people who live in villages, those people who are illiterate, they are the ones who are impacted by the media and we are kind of beyond this. Or young people are impacted, it is impressionable young minds and we need to, uh, you know, protect these young minds and uh, we need to sort of be careful about, you know, what we show. Uh, and it very often is a very simplistic kind of relationship that we posit as if, you know, we can handle it, but those can't, and those people are impacted in a very direct way through uh, behavior. Uh, and this brings us to the, the, uh, the next notion, which is that there is a lot of moral panic over representations of sexuality. And this particularly in the, you know, last decade as the global media has uh, come in, as satellite channels have burgeoned, uh, you know, there is, and interestingly, I, I mean, I've been doing some research with audiences, qualitative studies, and I find that when one, uh, you know, talks to parents, they're much more concerned about sexuality than about violence. You know, they don't care how much violence even their little children are exposed to, but they're very 
cherry about you know children being exposed to uh, you know any violence they're so scared about things like this was some years ago when MTV uh, first came in they were very scared about uh, you know what MTV was doing to their children but they couldn't care less and I think there is a lot of uh, violence against women uh, that is kind of uh, you know naturalized normalized so I mean in so many films you see you know the uh, a husband hitting a wife or you know a brother slapping a sister i mean this is kind of normal or even the so called eve teasing and you know where uh, uh, you you see a woman who's kind of this kind of modern western woman who's flaunting her assets and then the man kind of humiliates her for doing that and you know and that's okay because you know she asked for it because of the way she dressed so i think we we need to uh, you know uh, kind of uh, question this kind of moral panic over the idea of sexuality and uh, in fact I think uh, when we come to the representation of sexuality very often we tend to conflate two things one is uh, you know sexual exploitation of women in the media and the other is any kind of representation of sexuality and desire and we look at the two as as the same and I think it's very important to make that difference because if we conflate the two then we are throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I think we need to understand that women are also sexual beings, women are desiring beings and uh, you know this kind of puritanical uh, attitude where we say that no, 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 any kind of uh, you know uh, kind of presence of women in public space that is not uh, you know like uh, in a Sati Savitri kind of manner needs to be uh, you know uh, excised from the media I think this this kind of idea is uh, problematic and hence uh, I mean the pop in the within the popular discourse we say that okay any kind of representation of sexuality and women is objectionable and hence we need uh, censorship I think we need to a censorship is not at all the way to go. Censorship is neither possible nor desirable in, in today's, uh, you know, internet world. And I think what we need to do is firstly critique these kind of very simplistic notions of media and behavioral change that we have. And also to realize that audiences are not so dumb. I mean, audiences relate to the media in far more complex ways. They really, all, even, even a non-literate person relates to the media not very differently from the way you and I do. They may be using different kinds of constructs, but they are also, they are also intelligent in their own way. And here I'd like to uh, quote from um, uh, uh, Deshmukh uh, Elias Puneet Agarwal who had this to say about uh, the Savita Bhabi uh, website when it was taken off and he says that to say that Savita Bhabi would inspire married women to become more promiscuous is like saying that Batman would inspire rich men to become nocturnal cape wearing vigilantes. So uh, I think we need to realize that uh, you know there is a role for fantasy for desire in people's lives and we can't just say that okay you know people see this and they imitate it it's it's a far more complex relationship between uh, that people have with the media and i think we need to take this on board uh, the other point which sharda made and which i would like to reiterate is beware of the normal it's these normalized forms of violence that are insidious that are far more devastating than uh, you know the uh, the more in your face uh, sexually explicit kind of uh, you know uh, material in fact, I would say that the Saas Bahu serials are far, far more damaging than Savita Bhabi. And in fact, I think Savita Bhabi is very empowering in some uh, ways to women because I think it uh, allows for the, the presence of a woman having sexual agency. So what we have to realize is that while there is an agenda of the text, there is also an agenda of the reader. And meaning is formed when these two agendas collide. And we have to look at... Uh, uh, the impact of media not just as a one-way thing but as an interaction between these two agendas. Uh, so coming to some of the things we need to keep in mind when we represent women and these are some ideas that I had. Uh, the first is that women are not just mothers, sisters, daughters, wives, just as men are not just fathers, brothers, sons and husbands. Women have a life of their own beyond their familial uh, relationships and I think the media needs to represent that far, far more. Uh, restricting uh, women to their familial uh, space, I think, is can be very disempowering. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about how the media objectify women. I think what we need to talk about is how do we subjectify representations of women? 
how do we begin to question stereotypes of docile uh, womanhood? How do we show women as active and resisting subjects? Uh, how do we show women as occupying public space? Uh, how do we affirm more plural notions of womanhood? Because very often when we show women, it's only upper class, elite women that are shown in the ads. But women come in, as Shada said, in all shapes and sizes and colors and, uh, you know, ages. And how do we uh, show more plurality in our representation of, of women? Uh, uh, violence against women at the end of the day, as uh, the earlier speakers have also uh, said, is not just about uh, men and women, but it's about the exercise of power and whether in public space or private space, one needs to question the source of power, which is patriarchy and patriarchal power. And I think, oh, of course, uh, advertisers are not going to be in the business of creating revolution, but I think you can attack patriarchy subtly, through humor in very many different ways and I think that is the challenge to you today. It's not just about, uh, you know, showing women this way or that way, but how do you question patriarchy? How do you question a system where women are seen as, uh, you know, not having any rights to property? And I think this is the question. And I'd quickly, before I end, I'd like to uh, show three uh, ads. Uh, can we have the first one, please? Uh, this is uh, one of my um, favorite ads and this, this see it first and then we'll talk about it. Hello. <laughs> what are you doing tonight? Me? Join me for dinner. Sure. See you at eight. One black coffee, please. Ericsson mobile phones. Surprisingly small. Yeah, this is a 1996 ad, I think it pras it's Prasoon Pandey's ad and uh, I was researching uh, uh, at that time and I found it was very, very popular among women who felt very triumphant about the way this man gets his come up comeuppance and in some sense they saw it as some kind of a symbolic revenge for all those times when they have been hit upon and were unable to respond appropriately. Uh, can we have the next one please? I have uh, sort of double uh, uh, feelings about this ad. I think on the one hand, it celebrates the presence and the right of young women to, uh, you know, access public space. Uh, uh, so the babylicious girl resists the attempt by the male spectator behind the two-way mirror to seize agency and reconfigure the role of the male as the arbiter of any display of female sexuality. At one level, she takes control of her sexuality. But at another level, she is position as this, you know, lovably immature uh, girl with who uses the bike as a fashion accessory and there is an element of condescension on the part of the advertiser. Why see the scooter only as a fashion accessory and not as an avenue to mobility that challenges patriarchy. So, uh, but at the same time, I think there is something in this ad that, uh, uh, you know, resists, uh, uh, you know, and that one needs to uh, sort of think about. And uh, to end with, uh, I'd like to show a small ad that we made ourselves for the uh, One Billion Rising campaign. It's been made by the faculty of the school and I'll end there. Thank you.
आई राइज मैं जागते मैं जाग उठी आई राइज नान बीत बिटे आई राइज मामा ने की सिटी ना मैं जाग उठी हूं आई राइज मैं जाग चू आई राइज नान एदे रुते आई राइज मो सचे थली हाउ जागे झाले आई राइज मैं जागृत आहे यान आई राइज मी जागृत आहे आई सर आम्ही जेगे उठी आई राइज मी जागते हूं जागू छु नान उन रंग मी जागते आहे काय नी रंग आई राइज आहू जागा गेली आई राइज